many believers started their Christian life with great expectations of a victorious Christian life, right? When we were still starting, we were all positively looking forward to a life of victory. We say we are going to overcome all trials and temptations out there. God will give us joy. We will live a, a, a victorious life, a life of fulfillment, a life of peace, and we will have the provision of God for all our needs. We were all looking forward to a victorious Christian life when we started out as new believers. Now, actually, this is in line with God's promises for us. In the Bible, God himself said that we Christians are more than conquerors, right? That in Christ or through Christ, we can do all things. And the Bible also tells us that we will live a full life, an abundant life. We'll have joy, peace, and God's provision, God's guidance, God's protection, and so on and so forth. So our expectation of uh, having a victorious Christian life is actually in line with God's will for us, right? But the problem is this. Unfortunately, after living our Christian life, or after some time we started in our Christian life, we realized that we are still living an empty and defeated life. Okay? We still we realized that we're still living empty and defeated life. Or perhaps, for some time, you were doing very well in your Christian life. But not long after, you notice that actually you're going back to the old life, the life that was defeated, the life that was empty, the life that was unfulfilling, a life that was struggling with sin, struggling with trials, struggling with temptations, and many times you realize that you were getting battered by all these forces. And so you scratch your head, and you say, what happened? I thought God has given me so many promises. I thought I'm going to live a victorious life now that I have already repented from my sins and put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? You know what happened? Actually, one of the major problems why after some time of becoming Christian, we uh, go back to an empty life or a defeated life is because some Christians, if not many Christians, live or are living based on their old identity. They revert to living based on their old identity, knowingly or unknowingly. Now, you might ask me, Pastor Rich, what do you mean living based on our old identity? Now, without going uh, to much details, before conversion or before we repented from our sins and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we stood guilty before God, okay? Before a holy and righteous God, before the perfect God, we sinners are all guilty before Him. That was our standing before God before we converted to Christianity. We stood guilty before Him. Look at me in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says here, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We stood guilty before God. Aside from that, since we stood guilty before God, we also stood condemned before God. Which means, if we die and we didn't reconcile with God when we were still living, we will be, we will be sent to hell. And we will suffer in hell for all eternity. That's what it means to be condemned by God. Not only were we guilty before God, we were sinners, okay? We were also condemned before God. Those were our standing before God when we were still non-Christians. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the first part says, For the wages or the payment of sin is what? Death. And that death is not only talking about physical death, it is talking about eternal death, which means when you die physically without reconciling with God when you were still alive, and then you die, you will die eternally, which means you will be forever separated from God while suffering in hell. That's eternal death. Okay, and so as a result, since we are we were sinners before God, and since we were uh, condemned before God, we were actually cut off from Him. 
we were not connected to God. That was our standing before we became Christians, before we got saved. That was our standing. We were cut off from God. Of course, there are some people out there who had this form of uh, spiritual uh, life. They felt, you know, since they were going to church, they were praying, they were talking about God, talking about spiritual things, they thought they were alive. No. In the eyes of God, holy, perfect, and righteous, we were spiritually dead before we became Christians. We were cut off from God. We were guilty. We were condemned. We were separated from Him. And so knowingly or unknowingly, non-believers or people before they became saved actually had this sense of rejection. Knowingly or unknowingly, they had this sense of rejection. Many times they just felt that people around them reject them. That's why they have to prove themselves, right? They have to compete so that people will love them, will accept them. Many times they, they think that it's just people around them rejecting them. The truth is, if they go deeper, in their hearts, they have this sense that God himself had rejected them. Before conver conversion, we had this sense. We had this uh, feeling or sense of being rejected. We had this uh, sense of uh, being uh, guilty or shame before God. We had guilt and shame. We also had weakness and helplessness. And thus, before conversion, we lived empty lives unfulfilled life, unsatisfying life, and we live defeated lives. Okay? You see, who we believe we are determines how we act. Again, who we believe we are determines how we act or how we live. Since before, we had this sense of rejection. We had this sense of uh, uh, guilt and shame. And we had this sense of weakness and helplessness. And so we acted that way. Because that's what we believe about ourselves. We were rejected. We were not secure. We were not important. And so we acted that way. And so we live a defeated and meaningless life. Now that we have become Christians, supposedly we should live a different life. The problem is, some, if not many, Christians are still feeling the same way. They still feel rejected. They still feel... Uh, uh, guilt and shame and they still feel uh, helpless and weak and so they continue to live empty and defeated lives they say yes maybe or perhaps at the most god has forgiven me of my sins in the first place jesus christ has already uh, paid for my sins on the cross of calvary but that's all of it god is still not pleased with me i'm still not secure i'm still not accepted i'm still unimportant that's what they feel, and that's why they continue to live uh, an empty and defeated life. Brothers and sisters, that was our old identity. When we repented from our sins and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that we were given a new identity. Are you listening? You now have a new identity, and as such, we should live our lives based on this new identity. Now, you might ask me, Pastor Rich, what is this new identity in Christ that you are talking about? Now, let me share with you our new identity as summarized by Dr. Neil Anderson on the website of Freedom in Christ Ministries. Now, I'm going to just breeze through this list so that you will just you will have an idea of what is our identity in Christ. I'll just give you an overview. So what or who are we in Christ? What is our new identity in Christ? First, you are accepted totally. Okay? That's your first identity. You are accepted. Now, you might ask me, Pastor Rich, what do you mean I am accepted? Why am I accepted by God? You are accepted because one you are God's child. Do you realize that you are God's child? You're not only God's servant. You're not only God's slave. Hey, you're not only a worshiper of God. You are God's child. He is your father. That's why you are accepted totally. Next, as a disciple, you are a friend of Jesus Christ. 
Again, you're not only a servant of Jesus Christ. You're not only a slave of Jesus Christ. You are a friend of Jesus Christ. This is implying that we have this intimate or potential of a uh, potential intimate relationship with Him. Okay? You are a friend of Jesus Christ. What else? You also have been justified. Now, you might ask me, Pastor Rich, what do you mean by justified? To be justified means to be pronounced not guilty. Justification is a technical term in theology. It means that a, a person who is justified means that he has been pronounced not guilty. You see, when you repent from your sins and you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, since he has already died for your sins on the cross of Calvary, he has pronounced you not guilty anymore. He has justified you. So in the eyes of God, you are no longer sinners. That's why you are accepted totally. What else? You are united with the Lord. And you are one with Him in spirit. Next, you have been bought with a price. And you belong to God. To whom do you belong, Christians? God. Do you realize that? You belong to God Himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It cannot get any better than that. What else? You are also a member of Christ's body, the church. You are a member of the family of God. You are really accepted by God. Next, you also have been chosen by God and adopted as His child. Some people think that they are rejects. Oh, no one wants me. I'm all alone. No one loves me. Guess what? The Bible tells us that you have been chosen by God. God chose you specifically, individually, for Him to save. Are you hearing this? Don't think that God had no one else to choose from. He had no one else to choose. That's why He picked you up. No. God had billions of people to choose, and yet He chose you among them. If that doesn't communicate to you that you are spe special, I don't know what does. Amen? You have been chosen by God and adopted as His child. Next, you, you have also been redeemed and forgiven of all your sins. God paid the price for your salvation. He bought you. He redeemed you. And that's why you have been forgiven of all your sins. Not just some, all of your sins. No, I don't care what the devil tells you. Maybe the devil is telling you, oh, God really has not forgiven you. Why would he forgive you? You have done so great a sin. I know all your dirty secrets. I know what you did in the past. Don't believe the lies of the devil. God has said he has already Redeem you and forgiven you of all your sins. And when God says all, He means all. Amen? Next, you are also complete in Christ. And last, you have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. Do you realize this? We don't need a human priest anymore. You don't need the Old Testament priest, to stand between you and God. You didn't even have to pass through him. You didn't even have to pass through the pastor before you can pray to God. No, you don't need any intermediary. You know why? Because you are now a child of God, and God says you have direct access to the throne of the grace of God through Jesus Christ, which means anytime you want to ask for the grace of God, anytime you want to come to the Lord and ask for His grace, you want to pray something or request something from Him, you have direct access. What does that tell us? It tell us, tells us that we have been accepted fully by God. That's our new identity. You are accepted. What else? Not only that you are accepted, the Bible also tells us that you are secure. In Jesus Christ, since you have already repented from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are secure in Him totally. You are safe. First, the Bible tells us that you are free from condemnation. You are free from condemnation. Okay? 
Now that you have already been forgiven by God, you will no longer be sent to hell. You don't have to worry about it anymore because Jesus Christ has already paid for your sins. Now, some people come to church. I know this, and maybe some of you are thinking of this now. I hope not. Or perhaps this was your thinking before. Many people come to church and do good works, hoping that when they die, they will be sent to hell. Right? That's their thinking. They say, oh, I will better make it sure that the, the, the good things that I, I have done should outweigh the bad things so that I will go to heaven. But even then, even after all these things, they are still not so sure. They still have this feeling, maybe God is going to send me to hell. They're not so sure. Get this. If you have already repented from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God declares that you are free from condemnation. No longer are you guilty before God. You will no longer be sent to hell. Amen? That's why you can feel secure. Every time you sleep at night, you can sleep soundly. You don't have to worry if God would take you while you are sleeping. You know for sure you're going to heaven. Amen? There's no more condemnation for you. Next, you're also secure because you are assured that God works for your good in all circumstances. There are so many things that are happening in our lives. Some of them positive. Others are negative. Ups and downs, highs and lows, right? Failures and victories and so on and so forth. And many times, this brings instability to us insecurity we say what will happen next what will happen if i get sick what will happen if we go bankrupt what will happen if we fail here or there we feel we are not secure because of different things that are happening in our life listen to this if you have already repented from your sins and put your trust in the lord jesus christ meaning you're already a christian he has promised that god will work everything that happens in your life life for your own good in the end are you hearing this no matter what happens whether it's positive or negative highs and lows ups and downs victories or failures whatever happens in your life you are assured you can be sure that in the end all things by the plan of god will work together for your own good Amen? Now, if we know that, and God, that's, what God, uh, that's what God tells us, assures us, should we be afraid? Of course we shouldn't be afraid. Why? Because God himself has guaranteed that all things will work together for our good in the end. Amen? So just we go on, just, we just go on in life faithfully serving Him and trusting Him. Next, you are also free from any condemnation brought against you and you cannot be separated from the love of God. Sometimes the devil will come to us. Actually, not just sometimes, but many times. He comes to us and he accuses us. He says, oh, you come to church week after week. You think God is pleased with you? You think God has uh, already accepted you? No way. He will never accept you. Unfortunately, some of us believe. And so we live empty lives. We live defeated lives. Listen up. God says, no one can separate you from his love. No one. Nothing. Even the biggest sin that you could commit in life, that sin cannot separate you from the love of God. Because in the first place, Jesus Christ has already paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. Everything of them, all of them. There's nothing that you can do and there's nothing that Satan or people out there can do to separate you from the love of God. That's why you are secure. What else? You also have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. You are also hidden with Christ in God. And you are also confident that God will complete the good work He started in you. You see, when you repented from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that moment, Jesus Christ started to fulfill His great plan for your life. Amen? Now listen up. 
Jesus Christ is not just a good starter. He's also a good finisher. What he has started, he will surely finish. He is not going to abandon you along the way. He's not going to say, okay, I gave up on you. You're so hard-headed. Oh, I changed my plan. I changed my mind. I'm not going to finish my plans in your life. No! What he has started in your life, he will finish. That's why you can feel secure. Next, the Bible also tells us that you are a citizen of heaven. Amen? You are citizens of heaven. We Christians are citizens of heaven. A good number of people in the Philippines migrate to first world countries because they want to be a citizen of prosperous and great nations. I understand their concern. I understand their, their desire. But listen to this. We Christians actually are citizens of the greatest kingdom, the greatest nation in the entire universe, in the entire history of mankind. We are citizens of heaven. Amen? That's why we are secure. If we will not have a good life here on earth, a prosperous life here on earth, for sure we will have a successful and prosperous life beyond this life because we are citizens of heaven. That's why we are secure. What else? We also have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. And last, you are born of God and the evil one cannot touch you unless you give him permission unless you live in sin then the devil can touch you otherwise if you walk faithfully in god and you appropriate the resources that god has given you the devil won't be able to touch you again that's why you are secure totally not only are we totally accepted by god not only are we fully secure in god lastly we are also significant in christ we are significant, meaning we are important. Now, I don't know what's going through your mind. Perhaps you're thinking, oh, I'm not really important, Pastor Rich. I'm a nobody. Nobody really wants me. Nobody loves me. People reject me. Not to God. Not to the mind of God. To God you are very significant. The Bible tells us first, you are a branch of Jesus Christ. The true vine and a channel of His life. You are connected to Jesus Christ. Okay, what else? You have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. You have a great mission on earth. Okay? You have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. Next, you are God's temple. Do you realize that? Do you realize that you are God's temple? You see, when you repented from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that moment, the Bible tells us that God sent the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to live within you. Now, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's within you, okay? He's not just in heaven. He's within each one of us, God himself. That's why our bodies are called the temple of God because he lives there permanently in you, in your body. And that's why I think this is the explanation. Uh, many times uh, I've heard uh, uh, the testimonies of former high-ranking occult practitioners who later became Christians. They said when they were still practicing occultism, okay, they said that Satan gave them the power to see who the real Christians were. According to their testimonies, now again, these people used to be high-ranking occult practitioners. Maybe they were into witchcraft. Maybe they were sorcerers. 
and they were operating based on the power of Satan. They said when they were not yet Christians, when they met Christians along the way, they would be able to tell that that person is Christian. You know how? According to their testimony, Christians glow. There's this brightness. There's this glow in the body of Christians. That's what they said. These were former high-ranking occult practitioners, perhaps sorcerers, sorceress, witch, wizards, who, were, who used to operate on the basis of Satan's power. Through the power of Satan, they were able to see these things. And they said, when they met Christians, they would know that they were Christians. Why? Because they were glowing. The body was glowing. Of course, we cannot see it right now. Right? But get this. If you sincerely repented from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they know who you are. They know. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are important. Yes, the world doesn't know who you are, but the Bible tells us in the end, when Jesus Christ comes again, we will, it shall be revealed who we really are. We are God's children. Amen? And we are significant. What else? You are also a minister of reconciliation for God. Do you know that you are ambassadors for Christ here on earth? You represent Christ. And He has given us a mission, and our mission is to represent Christ before all these unbelievers. We are here to tell them about Jesus Christ, and we are here to appeal to them to believe in the Lord. We are ambassadors. You are important. Next, you are seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. In some sense, we are already reigning with Christ. We have authority on earth, the authority that God has delegated to us, and we can fulfill God's purposes here on earth through the power and the authority that He has given us. We are seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. Next, you are God's workmanship. You are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece. Of course, you are not yet finished. That's why they still don't see the entire thing. But I tell you, it's just a matter of time. Since God is your sculpture, God is your creator, in the end, they will see the beauty in you. Second to the last, you may approach God with freedom and confidence. You don't have to be afraid of God. You are His son. You are his child, right? You are his daughter. You may approach God with freedom and confidence. And last but not the least, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. What do we see here? We Christians are actually completely accepted by God. You are not a reject. You are completely accepted by God. You are also completely secure. And you are significant. You are important. Amen? Now, in summary, let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. Here in this passage, we will see who we are in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, it says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. 
In Him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believe in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, this is who you are in Christ. You are accepted, you are secure, you are significant. And you should live like this. This is your new identity. Amen? Why don't we give God a clap offering for this? You are no losers. Don't listen to other people tell you who you are. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Just listen to the Lord. He is your creator. He is your ruler. He is your redeemer. And He is... He says you are accepted by Him fully. You are secured totally in Him. And you are significant. You are important. So live a life of meaning. Live in victory, not in emptiness and defeat. Amen? Unfortunately, some, if not many Christians, are living in defeat and emptiness for the simple reason that they are living based on their old identity. They go back to their old identity. They were always, they're always thinking, oh, I'm a reject. I am guilty. I have shame. I am weak. I am helpless. I'm always this way. You know, I have a bad temper. I struggle with these things. I'm weak and so on and so forth. Some Christians are like that. They always go back to those things instead of moving on. Now, I'm not saying that once you become a Christian, you will never sin anymore. Okay? You will still sin from time to time because you still have your sinful nature. As long as you have this mortal body and you are in this mortal body, this side of life, you will sin from time to time. But listen to this. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to live in defeat. If you sin, repent from your sin and move on. You can do that. You don't have to stay in the mud of sin and in self-pity. You can always bounce back. Why? Because God has already saved you and has given you resources. Amen? But the problem is many Christians continue to live based on their old identity. Now you might ask me, Pastor Rich, why is it that some Christians continue to live based on their old identity? Let me share with you four reasons why. First, some Christians continue to live based on their old identity, although they already have a new identity, because they are ignorant of their new identity in Christ. They do not know who they really are. Remember, who you believe you are determines how you act or how you live. Since you think you are reject, you are weak, you are helpless, you are, you know, guilty, you are nothing, and so you act that way. You live an empty and defeated life. That's simple. Some Christians continue to live based on their old identity because they are ignorant of their new identity in Christ. Number two, another reason why some Christians continue to live based on their old identity is because they lack discipline in living out their new identity. They lack discipline in living out their new identity. You see, I know some people who are smart, really, and are also talented, and yet you will see that they have not accomplished anything in life. And you scratch your head. Pastor Rich, is there such a thing as that? Smart and talented that has not accomplished anything in life? There are many, actually. Right? What's the problem? The problem is not because they are not smart. I told you, they're smart. The problem is not because they are not talented. I told you, they are talented. So what's the problem? If they are smart and they are talented, why is it that they are not able to develop to their fullest potential? You know what's the problem? Lack of discipline. 
lack of discipline. They do not exert effort. It's the same thing in our Christian life. Many Christians continue to live in their, based on their old identity because they lack discipline in living out their new identity. It takes effort to live your new identity. Yeah, another one, some Christians do not uh, continue to live based on their old identity because they do not follow and depend on the Holy Spirit. They do not follow and depend on the Holy Spirit. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, right? He is there to guide you, to lead you, and to empower you to fulfill God's wonderful purposes in your life. Amen? The problem is those purposes are not being fulfilled because we are not following the Holy Spirit and depending on His power. Another reason why some believers continue to uh, live based on their old identity is because they do not believe the truth about their new identity. They do not believe the truth about their new identity. This guy knows who he is. The problem is, he doesn't believe. <laughs> he says, is that really true? Maybe it, it applies to other Christians. Maybe to, it applies to him or to her. But it's, it's not true of me. God is not pleased with me. I'm not really important. I really don't have those things that you are saying that God has given us. No, maybe for you it's true, not for me. He knows his identity, but doesn't believe. And so, remember, who you believe you are determines how you act. If that's what you believe about yourself, even if I tell you over and over again that you are this and that, you know, if you believe otherwise, you will live according to what you actually believe, not what I tell you. Okay, so those are the four reasons why Christians, although they already have a new nature, a new identity, they, but still they continue to live based on their old identity, and as such, they continue to live a defeated and empty life. Now, of course, as Christians, we should not live this way, right? God has greater plans for you. You have not been born spiritually to be a loser. Did you hear that? You're not a loser. God has great plans for you. And so we must learn how to live based on our new identity. How? Let me share with you four ways. Number one, we should regularly study God's word to know or be reminded of our new identity. If you want to live based on your new identity and thus live a satisfying, a meaningful, and a victorious life, you should regularly study God's word to know or be reminded of your new identity. Again, we often behave based on what we believe and what we often think about. If this is what we believe, or this is what we believe about ourselves, or this is what we often think about, in all likelihood, we will behave that way. Therefore, if you want to live based on your new identity, then you have to regularly study the Word of God. You have to fill your mind with the Word of God. Look at me in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The Apostle Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Apostle Paul says, hey, you're Christians. Don't imitate the ways of the world. Don't live according to your old identity, the sinful identity. Instead, you live a transformed life. The question is, how? How do you live based on your new identity? Or how do you live a transformed life? He says, renew your mind. Change your thinking. Because many times we behave based on what we believe. 
So change your thinking. And how do we do that? We study the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible has been given to all of us to teach us what to believe, okay? To rebuke us if we are in the wrong, to correct our wrongs so that we start doing the right thing, and to train us how to live a godly life. For what purpose? So that we will be complete and equipped for every good work. If we are regularly studying the Word of God, we will go, grow spiritually and we will be able to fulfill all the plans of God for our lives. Amen? So if you want to live based on your new identity, you should regularly study God's Word to know or be reminded of your new identity. Number two. Another thing that you should do or we should do if we want to live out our new identity is to diligently exert effort. Diligently exert effort in putting off our old self and putting on the new one. In other words, discipline yourself. You see, we are individually responsible for our spiritual growth, for our freedom, for our victory. God has already provided everything that we need. He has provided us the Holy Spirit to empower us. He's provided us His Word to educate us. Now we are responsible to use them, to appropriate them, so that we will indeed be able to live a victorious life. We should not be like Juan Tamad. We all know the story of Juan Tamad, right? Juan Tamad wants to eat. He's hungry. And he saw this tree with many fruits. What did he do? Simple. He lied down under the tree, opened his mouth, and waited for the fruit to fall. That's Juan Tamad. Tamad in Philippine or in English means lazy. Juan the lazy. That's what he did. Now, do you expect this guy, Juan Tamad, to become healthy by doing that all day long? He's hungry, yes. He wants to be healthy, yes. But all he does every day is that. Lie down, <laughs> open his mouth, wait for the food to fall into his mouth. Some Christians are like that. They say they want to grow, and yet they do not exert effort. They don't even read their Bible. They don't even pray. They don't even come to church regularly. They don't fellowship. They don't minister. How do you expect yourself to grow or to fulfill God's plans for your life? Okay? You are responsible, individually responsible for your growth, victory, and Freedom. Look at me in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 10. It says here, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. This was your old life, your old identity, Right? And the Bible says, you once walked in this road. You once lived this way. But the Apostle Paul says, now you now have a new identity. Stop living according to your old identity. Instead, verse 8, now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, saying that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Okay, this is what we call the put-on, put-off principle. Okay. 
you put off the old identity. Meaning, stop living according to your old identity. You are no longer like that. Amen? Stop going back to that. And stop living according to that. You're no longer like that. Yes, again. I understand. We still have our sinful nature within us. Because as long as we have this mortal body, we still have our sinful nature. But listen to this. Aside from your sinful nature, when you repented from your, your, your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that God has given you a new nature. The, old, the new identity that is created in the holy and righteous image of God. Stop living based on your old identity. Instead, start living based on your new identity. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. And you need discipline to do that. Listen, you now have a new identity. You have to discipline yourself. Make the right decisions. Choose to do the right thing. Fight! for your new identity. Amen? Live in the right way. If you want to fulfill God's purposes for your life. Number three, another thing that you should do or we should do if you want to live out our new identity is to constantly follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and depend on His power. Constantly follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and depend on His power. Again, the Holy Spirit now lives within you. And He's there to lead you and to empower you. Okay? So if you want to live out your new identity, follow Him and depend on His power. Look at me in John 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, one of His works. Is there to remind you of what you already know or to teach you what you still don't know and urge you to follow the will of God? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus Christ told his disciples before he went back to heaven, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in an old Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Shortly before Jesus Christ went back to heaven, he promised that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they will receive power. Now, in context, this power talks about power to witness. They will be able to spread the gospel and Many people will believe them. People will be enlightened. Strongholds of Satan in the minds of people will be destroyed. That's the power of witnessing. And in context, this is what it's being talked about here in this verse. Jesus Christ says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Okay? However, power actually, the power of the Holy Spirit is not limited to power for witnessing alone. If you study the New Testament, you will realize that the power of the Holy Spirit that is upon you, upon all of us here, Christians, is also power for living. Power that will enable you to obey God. Power that will enable you to fulfill God's purposes in your life, to overcome all trials and temptations. Okay, that's the power. So if you want to live out your new identity, you have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and depend on His power. Amen? Now, I understand. There's a lot of talk out there among us Christians. And uh, as Christians, we often love to say, oh, I depend on the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit or without God, I am nothing. I cannot even lift a finger without God. So I completely depend on the Holy Spirit. I do not depend on myself. Now, those are nice sounding words, right? And many Christians love to say those things. The question is, do we really mean what we say? Do we really depend on the Holy Spirit? Or maybe it's just all talk. Or maybe we're just paying lip service to this. Or we just know what to, the right words to say. 
But in actuality, we are not really depending on the Holy Spirit. Many Christians are not living victorious lives because they are not really depending on the Holy Spirit. It's all talk. Now, how do we know if what we are saying is really true? How do we know if a person is really depending on the Holy Spirit apart from his claim that he does? Two things, two signs. One, we know that we are depending, truly depending on the Holy Spirit when we follow his leading. Okay? You see, the Holy Spirit is there to remind you of the truth about God and about what God wants us to do. Many times, He will tell us something that to the eyes of the world is not practical or it's not the formula for success, right? And so we are tempted to say, hey, I don't want, maybe I don't want to do this. If I follow the way of the Holy Spirit, and this is what He's telling me to do, in all likelihood, I will go bankrupt or I'm not going to earn anything. But the Holy Spirit says, this is what you do. If you truly depend on Him, you will take the risk. Because if you really truly depend on Him, you will trust Him that this thing that He wants you to do is the right way, and in the end, it's not by your might, it's not by your power, but it is by His power, by His might. All you have to do is follow, and He will do the rest. Okay? Another way of knowing if you truly depend on Him is that you constantly pray for the empowerment or the enablement of the Holy Spirit. In everything that you do, you always plead for His mercy and grace. You say, Lord, help me. Help me with my job. Help me with my ministry. Help me with my relationships. In everything that you do, you ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. If you are prayerful, if you are constantly praying, for the grace of the Holy Spirit, for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, then you are truly depending on Him. Otherwise, it's just all talk. Listen to this. What you are not praying for is something that you are doing on your own, not through the power of the Holy Spirit. Last but not the least, if we want to live out our new identity, we should take God at His word, as to who we really are in Christ and live accordingly. We should take God as word, meaning we will believe the word of God. If he says this is you, you are this, you are that, you believe it. Okay, believe. Don't just know it intellectually, but believe and live accordingly. Stop believing the lies of the devil. Let the devil say all he wants to you. Tell you you are a reject, you are a failure, you're a loser. Let him say those words. Let him tell you, hey, the Lord is not pleased with you. The Lord has not accepted you. You will never amount to anything. You will not be able to fulfill the purposes of God for you. Let him say those words, but don't believe him. Those are lies. Just intended to bring you down because God the, the devil knows once you believe those things you will be paralyzed and you won't be able to fulfill God's plan for your lives one day while a man was walking through the forest he happened to see a young eagle fall out of its nest and so this man pitied the bird and so he picked it up and brought it home and while there, he mixed the young eagle with his chickens. And so that's how the e young eagle grew up. It lived with the chickens. So not long after, the young eagle copied the behavior of the chickens. The eagle lived like a chicken, ate like a chicken, walked like a chicken, slept like a chicken, everything like a chicken. But it was an eagle. But, actually, but the problem was, it didn't know that it was an eagle. It never even learned how to fly. So one day, another man passed by that place, and he saw the plight of this eagle. And he pitied the eagle, and he said, what happened to you? You are an eagle. And so the second man picked up the eagle and 
lift him high above. And he said to the bird, You are an eagle. You do not belong to the earth. You belong to the sky. So now stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, just look at him. The eagle didn't have any idea what he was talking about. He didn't even know who he was. The eagle was confused. And so the eagle looked around. And when the eagle saw the other chicken starting to feed, he jumped off the hand and joined his chicken friends. It was a chicken to his mind. The man was not happy, but he didn't give up. He picked up the eagle again. And this time he took the eagle to the roof of the house. And there he said, you are an eagle. You belong to the sky. You do not belong to the earth. So stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle just looked at him again. Blank stare. No idea what this man was talking about. He didn't have any idea who he was. He was confused. And so when the eagle saw the other chickens feeding again, he jumped off the hand of the man, joined his chicken friends. Finally, the man picked up the eagle and he brought him to a high mountain. And there on that mountain, he said, you are an eagle. You are the king of the birds. You belong to the sky, not to the earth. So stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle didn't move. Still the same. He, he was confused. What is this man talking about? And so the man kept urging the eagle, You are an eagle. You are king of the birds. Fly. Stretch forth your wings and fly. You belong to the sky. He kept on urging him. Now while he was urging him, all of a sudden, the eagle lost its balance. And quickly, it stretched forth its wings. And with a triumphant cry, it began to flap its wings. And it soared away into the sky never to return again to lead the life of a chicken. The eagle has realized its full potential. Brothers and sisters, you are no chickens. You are eagles. Do not believe the lies of the devil. I don't know what you're going through right now in your life. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're saying, oh, I'm quitting. I'm abandoning this thing. I cannot do this. I always fall into sin. Or I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm never going to be successful in life. I will never be able to, to fulfill my, uh, the purposes of God. Is that the state of your mind? Listen to this. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. You are no chickens. You are eagles. You stand with your head held high, stress for your wings, and fly. Because you are eagles. Live based on your new identity. And you will see, I guarantee you, based on the word of God, you will see greater days ahead of you. You will be able to live a truly meaningful life and a truly victorious life, and you'll be able to fulfill God's purposes for your life. Amen? Why don't we give God a clap offering for that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that in you we are totally accepted. In you, we are totally secure. And in you, we are significant. And this is our identity that we now have, not only now, but for all eternity. Help us, Lord God, to live based on our new identity in this world, that we may be able to reach our full potential to the glory of your name for your joy as well as ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.